Renee Elizondo is one of the most important parts of Janet Jackson's career and legacy, in my opinion, on the level of a Jam and Lewis. His influence is more his part in Janet's creative direction and business decisions, but due to the destruction of all personal and business ties with Janet after their separation and divorce at the turn of the century, and legal proceedings basically prohibiting both from really discussing their relationship and the demise in detail. For me, this is sad because he had a massive influence on why and how Janet explored certain subject material, especially with Janet period and the Velvet Rope. And especially with the Velvet Rope, as I honestly cannot hear the lyrics and not think Renee. In a 2001 Entertainment Weekly article celebrating her upcoming album, All For You, it says this. If you're looking for a breakup album, Jackson and Jam say Rope is it even though technically it preceded the breakup with Elizondo, and even though Elizondo got a credit as Rope's co-writer and co-producer. All For You is being cast as the recovery album, the one that marks her escape from the gloom. Honestly, she says of the riff, if it would have brought me down, the record would have been Joni Mitchell's Blue. The Velvet Rope is a concept album centered around introspection, but introspection which is focused on the relationships around Janet and how intimacy empowers her, but at the same time has a very unfulfilling quality. And I believe the catalyst to this exploration of both self and human intimacy was triggered by the breakdown in her relationship with Renee Elizondo, the most central relationship in her life. So Janet and Renee Elizondo met in about 1982, starting off as friends with no intention of being in a relationship. When Janet got her marriage to James DeBarge annulled nearing the end of 1985, Renee was a massive support to Janet during this time. But by 1987, they were in a committed relationship and engaged. In a 1998 article entitled Sex, Sadness and the Triumph of Janet Jackson, David Ritz writes his observation about Janet and Renee's relationship. You cannot understand Janet without understanding Renee. For the past 12 years, they have been a team, a study in yin yang, Janet is an introvert, Renee a rousing extrovert. Janet is a reluctant talker, Renee can riff for hours. They met when he was an assistant cameraman. His interests as a filmmaker, songwriter and photographer are in envelope pushing projects. When I've watched Renee and Janet work together in their studio or discuss matters in their Malibu home, they appear as two halves of a whole. They are both lightning fast thinkers and one often completes a thought another has begun. There seems to be no hierarchy no boss. They operate on the same wavelength. They are almost always together and Renee, as chief advisor and constant collaborator, is intensely focused on Janet's career. He has had a creative hand in all of her videos since Rhythm Nation and three of them, That's The Way Love Goes, Again and the recent alternative version of Together Again, he directed. Renee, says Janet, has been my co-writer on almost all of my songs since Rhythm Nation but has refused to take credit. He wanted to prove that he wasn't with me to take but to give. I appreciate that attitude but I also saw it was leading up to feelings of fraudulence on his part and mine. Make note of that. So by the time it comes to Rhythm Nation, Renee is fully part of the creative process. I think this is something we would recognise today as a creative director but that back then that wasn't something that was a official label or something that was labelled. He just acted as an extension of Janet as the person closest to her. He has shown extensively in making of videos, helping with choreography and commenting on the creative process. In 1991, the two wed. It's a secret, intimate wedding kept completely out of the public eye. And I think the marriage is actually a catalyst to where we do see Janet cr cross the boundary of sensual content and expression with Love Will Never Do being in 1991 and the Janet album. It makes sense, again, with Janet's religious background, that her being a married woman legitimises her public exploration of sex and why she would feel so comfortable to finally open up. And again, Renee seems to be a big part of why. He directed the videos for That's The Way Love Goes and Again, which are incredibly sensual videos, especially the video Again, which focuses on the sexual and physical chemistry between Janet and the male partner in her video. And there's a part in the Janet doc showing the filming of the Again video. And personally, it's remarkable how comfortable Renee was, but how well he as a director was able to frame Janet so successfully as a sex icon. My view, my view, my view, is that in some ways it's this idealization of Janet 
um, and this image of sexuality that she has created. And in some ways you could say that they've both created. In one interview, he says, Janet is so hot, he says, it should have come with a condom. Janet and Renee seem committed to cultivating this version of Janet to serve as a fantasy for the general public. And it could be argued that as a husband, this fantasy is serving him and his pleasure too. It's a quote like this that she says um, in 1983, she says, um, and that's why Renee suggested I surround myself with the kids in the dance troupe and let me relax, just be myself. There's, there's this dynamic coming across, which is very symbiotic in nature. Um, at the end of their marriage um, in 2000, Renee essentially comes out and he makes certain claims about his character. One of them being that he exhibits dependent characteristics. This is argued that it resulted in him being submissive to Janet um, and him making self-sacrifices. And this could be interpreted as him... Um, and this could be interpreted as him subverting all of his own general and creative energy to the betterment of Janet's career. To me, this illustrates what seems to be the paradoxal relationship that they had. In some ways, Renee is submissive to Janet and willing to give to her and her career. However, in other ways, um, there's a version of Renee that I perceive to be controlling and invasive of Janet's boundaries, self-identity, control and autonomy. And ultimately, both of those narratives can coexist and both of those narratives, I believe, add um, another layer of context to The Velvet Rope. Because in Janet's 2022 documentary, when discussing Renee and his and hers relationship, he seems like someone who was very well intended, but felt a sense of entitlement and, yes, control when it came to Janet's public persona and career. And I think Janet's and I think Janet's private persona suffered and became more aligned to the public one. With the Janet period projects and the Velvet Rope project, um, we see Renee's presence becoming more apparent. And even circling back to the willingness to participate in the framing of Janet's sexual image, I don't know, especially with the comment of Janet is so hot, um, it should have come with a condom. Renee seems to be keen to contribute to the fetishization of his wife, or at least in the creating of this fantasy version of her. Fetishism is defined as a individual being attracted to a non-living object or body part that is not the genitalia. It can also be defined as having an excessive and irrational commitment to something. And I mean, Renee does openly exhibit behaviour in line with that second definition. In Janet's 2011 memoir, she reveals another element about their relationship. She revealed that after the Love Will Never Do shoot, a loved one said this. You can't be seen in public like that. You look nothing like your video, nothing like your TV appearances. You can't go out. On this comment, she expounds and she says this. I wasn't living life. Even though I was a homebody, it deeply hurt me to be told I shouldn't go to the movies just because I didn't look right. I wish I'd been able to cry. I realise now I was too numb. Crying would have given me some form of release. Once again, I kept it inside. I didn't answer, I didn't argue. I simply absorbed the comment and as crazy as it seems, I didn't go out after shooting videos, especially if I'd gained any weight at all. Between tours and records, I disappeared from the public. So Renee, who Janet deeply trusts as this extension of her, is cultivating this version of Janet Jackson for the consumption of the public, which is being done at the cost of Janet's private and personal personhood. And I think that's the problem when you have the closest person to you intimately involved in your career and creative process. Because, and, because according to Renee, his involvement in Janet's career basically began out of the insecurity that Janet had as being viewed as producer dependent after the after the success of Control. Early on in our relationship, she told me she was concerned about being viewed as a producer dependent performer who was riding on her brother Michael's coattails. Janet told me that she was concerned that she was not being respected as an artist and that any gains she had made in popularity and control 
and career would be short-lived because she was not viewed as an artist. Janet's fears were typified in a cartoon that appeared in Rolling Stone magazine in 1986, which showed her producers, Terry Lewis and Jimmy Jam, holding strings which controlled the puppet in Janet's image. I told Janet that she should start writing her own songs to erase the puppet image. As a result, Janet and I began writing songs together. We agreed that Janet would take obscene public credit for my songwriting in order to validate her image as an artist, but we would share the proceeds. In essence, we formed a partnership to collaborate in the creation of music and entertainment. Janet told me that whatever was created from our music together would be ours and that with my existence we would earn more money through her, according to Renee. And that's interesting because really if you look at Janet's career, a lot of one of her main goals is to take control of who she is, particularly in terms of her artistry. The control era was defined so much by her taking control and autonomy from her father and her ex-husband. So for these narratives to form suggesting that she's not of her own artistry must have been frustrating. And I think that's a reason to the constant exploration of the theme of control. To entangle Renee in this quest for control is a choice. It's a choice. Because she's constantly having to prove that the music is hers, that the success is hers. And for Renee, it must be easy in some sense because he knows Janet so well. Obviously, they by control, they're in a relationship and he's been with her through her marriage and perhaps before, literally, the start of her career is the year that she met Renee. So again, yeah, it must be easy. But in another way, it's a mess because... There's no sense of boundaries there. His job is to be Janet Jackson too. He's a co-writer. He's a creative director. To successfully contribute, he must has to exist and place himself in Janet's perspective and contribute to her own ideas on things such as sexuality. No one can accurately speak for you apart from yourself. And especially with the music being so dependent on Janet's identities, such as being a black woman, things Renee is not but yeah so like for him to be good at his job he needs to embody Janet Jackson and he also in some sense needs to exert control of Janet Jackson's and her attitude on marriage seems to have allowed this to happen lessons learned at my mother's knee were subconsciously a part of my very being stick by your man loyalty is unquestioned and absolute never abandon never give up tolerate what needs to be tolerated work it out understand let love see you through it took me more than a decade to see the truth about my relationship with renee in the 2022 documentary she reveals that that was the nature of, re of their relationship he would say these things which would constantly undermine her put her down he had this fixation on the public janet to the detriment of the private janet and it's interesting that after after this first comment the love will never do comment she is constantly working constantly presenting not as janet but janet jackson i'm gonna run down her working life ready she filmed her role in poetic justice from april 1992 to july 1992 two months later she starts working on janet period the album from september 1992 to february 1993 she starts shooting videos and preparing to promote janet period from march 1993 that's the way love goes comes out in april and the album in may so at that point the intense album cycle starts with live performances more music videos interviews photo shoots etc the janet world tour starts in november 1993 and ends in april 1995 during the breaks from the tour she works on screen with her brother michael recording the song in october and december of 1994 a month after the tour, she records the music video for Scream, the most expensive music video of all time. She then begins works on two new songs and the promotional cycle for Design of the Decade, 1986 to 1996, a compilation album of all of her top 10 hits under the label A&M. Runaway and 24 Play were recorded around June to August of 1995, with Runaway coming out in August 1995. 24 Play was then released as a single in January 1996 with a video too. She then signs a new contract for Virgin Records in January 1996 for an unprecedented $80 million, again becoming the world's highest paid music artist of all time. That's essentially working pretty much non-stop from summer of 1992 
to the beginning of 1996. Three and a half years. I mean, that is normal. At the same time, that's not very normal. That's going from place to place, doing this to this to this to this. Physically, it's a lot. And how can a relationship and a marriage survive when husband and wife are constantly in business mode, in work mode, pretty much for the entirety of the marriage? Because they got married again in 1991. And then this cycle starts like in 1992. A, A marriage is meant to be this environment where two individuals should feel seen as their whole selves. Um, but there seems to be the tension with this notion. Renee's being is devoted and dedicated to this idea of Janet, which the two of them are both curating. What sort of disconnect does this create with your perception of self? Especially when you're constantly exploring the theme of control in your music. Janet, through her discography, has been going through this coming into our own as a woman, reckoning with her place in the world and then being empowered by that control to stand in her power and truth. This is the public narrative and this has been something that she's been embodying for now 10 years at this point. But privately, as she gets deep into her marriage with Renee, they slip deeper into the chains of codependency where egos merge and identities are confused, as Janet states in an Essence interview in 2001. And I think this is, and this is, and that's what's interesting. And this is the whole thing that kind of made me want to do this docuseries, this series of videos, is it was a quote from um, the Janet Lifetime documentary. And it was from her stylist, Wayne Scott Lucas. It was a magic relationship if it didn't hurt so much. The control got so bad that I always said, how did you write that song, Control? And we all believe it. And then you marry a guy and the control is so stifling. And I think the Velvet Rope as an album is an acknowledgement and an exploration of the turmoil going on in her relationship with Renee and the emotions and process of liberation that Jana had to take. Come to terms with her notion of control and reconciling that with your true self. The concept of control is crumbling around Janet, as we see, both in her personal life and professionally. And through that depression that she enters in, um, at the end of the Janet World Tour, she experiences an emotional breakdown. It's like everything that Janet has explored on the theme of control crumbles. Has she been naive? How could she be so naive in her relationship and in her marriage, in her career and in her identity? Janet was extremely successful. The record revealed who I was at that moment, presenting sensuality as an important and beautiful part of my being. I was feeling optimistic, I was feeling free. Within that feeling of freedom were seeds of discontent. I worked compulsively. There was a lot of pressure to achieve a certain look and I, once I'd achieved it, to maintain it at all times. The photography, the videos, the world tour, the pressure was unrelenting to look a certain way during the entire process. In my determination to keep slim down, I overdid it. I underate and abused the laxatives to keep the weight off. In short, I didn't take care of myself. Writing, recording, promoting and touring for Janet was hard work, but I loved it. But I'm talking about four years of 18 hour work days, six to seven hours a week, non-stop work, trying to look the way other people thought I needed to be. I was exhausted. No, I'm not going to point fingers and accuse anyone of manipulating me. I take responsibility for my choices. Meanwhile, the relationship I was in that brought me comfort now showed signs of serious strain. Eventually, it would collapse. In truth, I entered in my own free will. Again, it was a choice for which I take responsibility. I don't believe in making excuses, nor I believe in blaming others. In the end, that does no good. I began to understand that my view of people, especially some who were very close to me, had not been as clear as I had imagined. Doubts crept into my mind. Self-condemnation crept into my heart. I was assaulted by harsh thoughts. How could my judgment have been so poor? How could I have been so naive? How could I have fooled myself into believing I was actually a good entertainer? I now understand that my inability to voice my pain had a lot to do with the way I was raised. Keep your problems to yourself. I was afraid of burdening others with my anxieties. I didn't want to be a whiner. In a later song, In better days, I wrote, I don't want to waste nobody's time. My escape was to do what I've always done, work. 
The demands of show business both helped and hurt me. It helped me keep active, hurt by allowing me to sweep the dirt under the rug. I acted as if nothing was wrong. So by her own admission, she does desire to take accountability, which again, something that will, will go deeper when we're actually looking at the velvet rope. But she's not talking about it. She's not leaning into community. Part of me, again, as she says in the in the book, she talks about this was due to upbringing where even within themselves, they don't seem to be really open with each other. Uh, they kind of hold on to their hurts and their upsets. Um, they hide their own marriages and their personal lives. During the press run of The Velvet Rope, Janet reveals that she hadn't spoken to Michael in about two years. When you're not community-minded, you hide and you find solace in yourself. But what do you do when you're fragmented? When who you are is distorted? Who can you run to? Your husband? The one that's with you 24-7, even when you're burying your soul in the lyrics of The Velvet Rope? They can't really see you. The one who in many ways has shaped and become you, even they can't see you. How do you grow? How do you heal? How can you be the one in control? That's what the velvet rope is. It challenges this notion of who you are within, in your relationships and how to recover, how to face your pain by yourself and for yourself and find peace. And I think, and I think the destruction of her relationship with Renee is the most important part of it. And it's almost this final piece to pushing her to find this true self, to go beyond the velvet rope and actually meet herself at her knees. And and this is something which is we'll see is paid off at the end of the Velvet Rope album. So in the next part, that's when we're going to be properly diving in to the Velvet Rope, unpiecing um, and unpacking the arc within the album. But I want to leave off with this. And this was a letter that Janet wrote um, in her Essence magazine cover story um, in 2001. And I think it sets us up perfectly um, for the next episode. Women have a hard time processing pain. At least I do. I tend to stuff it or deny it or deaden it by working too hard and too long. But I'm changing. I'm looking for healthy ways to process pain. I do it by sharing with friends the simple truth of where I've been, where I am and where I want to go. My journey has been marked with twists and turns. The drama has been intense. My challenge, like that of so many of us, is not to judge myself. I tend to take blame for anything that has gone wrong. I am a harsh and cruel self-critic. I long to treat myself gently, but because of the privileges I've had in life, I don't think I'm entitled to acknowledge pain and loss. That nasty self-critic in me sees it as whining. As the youngest daughter of a family steeped in show business, I'm expected to smile, radiate happiness, exude optimism and joy. That's a pressure that I both accept and resist. I believe I was born to entertain. That's the public Janet. The private Janet is another matter. The private Janet likes to listen more than talk. If I go to clubs with my friends, I get too embarrassed to dance. I don't think I'll measure up to the other dancers on the floor. I stay at home with my dogs, munch on strawberry and cream, listen to jazz. As a little girl, I clung closely to my mother. My mother was my refuge, my world. My earliest memories of waiting for my brothers to return from tour. I missed them terribly. When I was five, the Jackson Five were at the height. The world's most popular boy band. Along with everyone else, I watched them on TV, saw them turn into cartoon characters, loved them, even idolised them, but interacted with them infrequently. We were always apart. The great distance between us has never been bridged. The concern for family is there, yet the distance remains. To this day, we have never quite caught up with one another. The non-stop demands of show business has thrown us in different directions. I was close to Michael due to his sensitivity, his sweetness, the way he sang to me and danced, the gentleness of his soul, had an enormous influence on me. He gave me his attention, in his relationship to our father, in his fierce resistance to authority, I saw the foreshadowing of my own relationship with the man we call Joseph. The Michael I knew best was teenage Michael. He inspired me. As adults, we rarely meet, but when we do, it's not as strangers, but as a loving brother and sister whose knowledge of each other is rooted in the past, not the present. 
We cherish dear memories. We sympathise over the single missing element of our childhood, the fact that our childhood never existed. What family isn't dysfunctional? What family isn't composed of crazy dreams and demands passed on or imposed from parent to child? I see those dreams as gifts. Without them, I'd get nowhere. Demands and desire commingled in our household. By desire, I mean drive, the need to succeed at any healthy cost. But early on, I knew that given so much dysfunction, I wanted out, out of my family and to be on my own. I married when, from all practical purposes, I was still a child, just 18 years old. I wasn't weddy. I watched my first husband, James DeBarge, wrestle with his demons. I felt his pain, understood his pain, understood his pain, but I didn't understand the impact of his pain on his behaviour. I wound up in the middle of a horror movie, broken hearted, disillusioned. I threw myself into work, into a career that first was still tied to my father. I broke that tie in the name of Control, my third album. That was in 1986, while I was still not yet 21. Control is a wonderful thing, but control is an illusion. No one but God is in control. That took me a long time to learn, another 14 years. The more we cling to the notion that we are in control, the greater the delusion. I admit, I was deluded. I married again, but this time in secret to Renee Elizondo, convinced that privacy would better protect the sanctity of our bond. As a wife, I reasoned that the private Janet would have a better chance than the public Janet. Lessons learned at my mother's knee were subconsciously as part of my very being. Stick by your man. Loyalty is unquestioned and absolute. Never abandon, never give up. Tolerate what needs to be tolerated. Work out, work it out. Understand, let love see you through. It took me over a decade to see the truth about my relationship with Renee. And it happened on the evening when I thought I was going blind. I was in Lyon, France, in 1989 on the Velvet Rope Tour. In two separate incidences, one which involved my dog and the other a magazine that had grazed my eye, my corneas had been scratched. Somehow I made it through the show, but afterwards my eyes were burning so bad that even lights on the dashboard felt like daggers. The throbbing was excruciating. We went looking for an hospital. It was past midnight where an impatient nurse applied sal a salve that only made it worse. Back up the hotel, my eyelids were swollen to the size of lipstick pencils. I cried all night. When the morning came, I couldn't see. But where my eyes had failed, my heart saw a clarity that I'd never seen before. I saw my marriage for what it was. It was that simple. My husband's concern was elsewhere. Other things dominated his attention. Se secret things I'd failed or refused to recognise. I won't say what these things are because they're not mine to reveal. We were ensnared in a sick, sad dance. The thing, the dance involved hours of therapy, but very little sincerity. The sickness was subtle. We had very few arguments. There was no physical abuse, but double lives were being led. Hidden agendas were being pursued. And I was seeing what I never wanted to see or admit. I dislike admitting it here. I'd been played. Millions of women had gone through this. So why is it so hard to admit that I'm among them? The public Janet feels obliged to protect positive vibes. The private Janet feels obliged to take blame. I feel like I should have known better, seen it coming, been smarter, wiser, shrewder. But you learn what you learn when you learn it. The chains of codependency, where egos are merged and identities are confused, are strong. To break them requires real determination. Those chains had been binding us for generations. Our parents' patterns, inherited from our parents, can haunt us for a lifetime. I'm grateful that my eyes were open and my heart, though broken, is on the mend. Now, let's go behind the velvet rope. 